under the checkout screen now. We're still looking at the settings of the store. It has a variety of sub-screens, as we can see. The checkout tab, for example. So we've got checkout, we've got the option force user registration. And the default is user can check out without a user account. The other one is user must register before checking out. Be very careful here. Um, for a couple of reasons. One is a reason of annoyance and one is a reason of uh, catastrophe. What I mean by that is if you activate users must register before checkout, it's telling you. You will also have to have the option of membership anyone can register in the general settings. The general <coughs> WordPress settings have a screen here. You don't have to go here. I'll, I'll go here. The general WordPress settings we saw a while ago has a um, an option anyone can register yes or no mine is off uh, so if I have that off and then on this screen here I'm saying a person must be registered there's no way for the person to register and therefore no way for anyone to buy anything catastrophic so let's say, okay, yes, I did activate the way for someone to create an account to register for the, for the site, and they must be registered to buy the product. Okay, it's, it's set up technically. Then you get to the reason of annoyance. There's a term in this industry called friction. Friction is anything that causes the user annoyance. And enough annoyance, enough fr friction, will cause them to abandon your shopping cart and go elsewhere where it's not so frictionful. So these little things here, like forcing them to create an account, forcing them to go to their email to verify, and come back, and oops, I mistyped the code, or whatever. All of that's causing friction. Why am I here? I'll go to Amazon. So I personally don't recommend, but you can decide how you want it. I don't recommend to having people having to have them an account. At the end of their checkout process, when it's all said and done, they still then could have the option to create an account when they're happy, not when they're trying to buy this product, having them jump through these hoops of creating an account. So I'm going to recommend users can check out without a user account. That decreases friction, keeps people on your site, keeps them happy. If you do check the second one, um, it looks like now they fixed this. In the older versions of the plugin, if you turn this on, must register, you had to manually go back to the general settings and turn on anyone can register. And that caused a lot of missed sales because you had a forcing them register for the site with no way to register for the site. Now it looks like when you turn this one on, they will automatically enable the membership option. That's useful. But I'm going to leave the default. You just can check out with an account. Here's another aspect of friction, which I think is kind of odd the way they've got it, so I'm going to tell you the way you should do it. Shipping same as billing. Turn on the first option. Enable same as billing checkbox. You've seen this when you're buying a product. You've got shipping and billing. And let's say I fill out my billing information. Then there's a spot for where, would sh where should we ship it to? Ship it to the same place. I've only got one house. But sometimes we need to buy from one, you know, buy it with a certain account and ship it elsewhere. Sure, so I have the option to change that. The default here, unfortunately, is user <coughs> must re-enter shipping every time. That's annoying. I don't want to put in my address again. Is there no way for my address to get automatically copied from billing into shipping? Yes this option here. So I, I don't know why they don't make that one the default, but I'm going to tell you, turning that one on, that decreases friction, keeps people happier, and happy users become happy customers, and then you become happy. And so if you, uh, if they want to buy with their home address, but then ship to the company address, they can still do that. But I would suggest turn that one on. Security encryption. Force users to use SSL. Allow site to be used insecurely and unencrypted. Oh no, I want, I want security. Actually, before you activate security, SSL is not free. SSL is something you have to buy from a provider like Bluehost or GoDaddy 
network solutions, etc., etc. They vary in price. They're usually about $90 per year. What you're doing is you're buying a security certificate, SSL encryption. You're buying that little lock that appears on the top left corner of websites, especially e-commerce websites, bank websites. <coughs> that lock. I want to see that lock when I log into my bank, when I buy a product, etc. You don't get that lock for free. <coughs> you have to pay a yearly subscription for these providers to vouch for your um, for your shop that you are secure. Notice HTTPS. Nowadays you're seeing HTTPS more often. That's HTTP security. That's part of the SSL encryption certificate. It's part of that $90 a year or whatever it costs to get that lock, to get the HTTPS, to get secure connections. So <coughs> just turning this on is not going to work. This can cause warnings if users of if you do not have a properly configured SSL. If I'm saying force SSL, force HTTPS, but I never went to GoDaddy and bought this thing, people are going to get errors and weird results. So we have to leave this unencrypted at the moment, but you're going to make a note when this is a real site on the real internet, you're going to invest in an SSL certificate. Because then you can activate this, your users will see that lock, they will be they will be um, uh, they will be sure it's a good site. But at the very least, remember, credit card information is going to be processed by PayPal, and they have security. So at a certain point, people are buying stuff in your cart. It's going to say, click to proceed to, to check uh, to pay. To pay. That'll then jump them over to the PayPal system, and they'll be able to pay with credit cards, etc., and then it'll be totally secure. So when it's still the most important part about, about adding credit cards, PayPal will be on top of it. So we have to leave it insecure, but it still will be secure when people actually put their credit cards. To make people more, to make them feel more safe, eventually you're going to invest in the SSL, turn it on, and your site will be more secure. You've got the checkout form fields. When someone buys a product, it's going to ask them for their billing and contact details, which you can change. You can just call that billing, if you'd like. What's their first name? What's their last name? What's their address, city, etc.? Maybe you want last name first, so you can just drag that these little lines. So my checkout form will ask last name and first name. Address, city, state, country, postal code. No one calls it postal code, they call it zip code. Phone, etc. Let's say we are not collecting a, a phone number. On the right side, you have a check mark display it or not. If you turn off the check mark, it will not display the phone number field. It won't ask for a phone number. It will not collect a phone number. You can display it or not. You can make it mandatory or not. So it is asking for all of this required information. Phone number was not mandatory. You can make it mandatory if you want. Let's say we also want to collect the person's Twitter address for some reason. So if I wanted to add a new field on the right side, add a field. So let's say we've got phone, email, click, and now we're asking Twitter. What's your Twitter? Is it going to be text that we're collecting? Is it going to be a radio button or a checkbox? So checkbox to turn something on or off, radio button to select like let's say male, female, decline, etc. Um, a selectable area, let's say it's got the options uh, like uh, uh, what's your 
what's your favorite color and you can have a list of six colors and the person can select red and yellow that's going to be select heading is to divide the screen here's this screen about this info here's another section for more info that's heading and text is one line of text that they can fill in a text area is multiple lines like a little paragraph so I could write here how did you hear about us and we'll say that there'll be a text area so it's going to ask them to write a little bit of text more text I'm just gonna say text Twitter it's gonna ask for the person's Twitter if I don't want this field anymore I could hide it or I could delete it if I delete it it's gone I have to recreate it if I hide it it's still there but then it's just not visible And then we've got a, a heading which divides the person. It's going to ask for the person's billing information and then their shipping information. And you can change this up however you want. I'll just say shipping, billing and shipping. And because of that other option on that other screen, this, will, uh, this could auto-populate if they choose. Or they can change it to a different place. Let's click Save Changes. And this is our main checkout form. We can add more than one checkout form because let's say certain products don't require so much information. So I can create a new checkout form and use the checkout form as necessary. Maybe also for the holidays I'm going to ask for a little bit more information. So I can create a new form and then use that form as appropriate. All of this information that is being asked for will be saved in the database of your, of your site. Uh, and if you don't have that SSL certificate, it could be vulnerable. That credit card stuff, again, PayPal will process it. But this that you're asking for will be saved to your .com, .net, whatever you have. So you're saying that even though you don't have the credit card information in there, all the other information mm -hmm. could be hacked. Yes. Yeah. They'll know numbers. their they'll know their phone number. That's gets that could say they'll know their Twitter, their state, etc. That's a lot of personal info. So that's why you do another reason why you do want to invest in the SSL certificate. Um, even though PayPal is going to take care of the payment processing, the SSL is still going to help you keep you your site safe. Make sure you save that screen and then let's look at uh, marketing. There's the concept of cross-selling and upselling. Users who bought this also bought we can turn that on or off. That's cross-selling or upselling. Technically, cross-selling is I bought a product, it cost me $10, it's going to recommend to me other products in that same horizontal range. $10, that same sort of product, cross-selling. Upselling is, okay, you're going to buy this $10 product. If you pay $20, you'll get an even better product, upselling. So this is the cross-selling. Upselling is not listed here because that's a little more advanced. And this is one of these items that, uh, that, that WooCommerce is better at. WooCommerce is better at grouping to do upselling, cross-selling, and so forth. But at the very least here, it'll tell you if you bought this, customers that bought this will also bought that. Why not you also buy that? You can do this if you'd like. I would recommend it. Yeah, get a little bit of cross-selling going on. You've probably fallen for it. I mean, benefited from it. <laughs> Share this social bookmarks. This is useful in that uh, people can, uh, if they like your product, there'll be a way for them to then share it on Twitter. But the, the version that's in WordPress, there are other plugins that do it better. If you don't have a social media plugin, this one might be 
might be good. If you've already got a social media plugin, this is overkill because it's going to have like two Twitter buttons. So at the moment, I don't believe we have an extra social media plugin. So I'll turn it on, but there are other ones, better ones. That, uh, for example, uh, Jetpack. When I mentioned Jetpack last month, I like the Jetpack social sharing feature. So I would not use this one as well as Jetpack. I don't believe we have Jetpack on at the moment, so I would use it until I get the better one. Same thing with this Facebook Like. The Jetpack social media feature is better, but I don't have it at the moment, so I'll turn on the Facebook Like. And that's useful because someone sees your product, they click Like, and the point of that Like is that then your product shows up in your, in your customer's Facebook, and, make, and that makes them marketers for you, that makes them cheerleaders for you, to their friends. Customer, how customers found us, add the how did you find about us drop down. I don't believe there's much customization to this, but it's going to ask the user, how did you find out about us? Uh, search, websites, radio, etc. Um, it's pretty basic, but here's a way you can collect information. It looks like my radio ads are working. It looks like my print ads are not working. So I'll just turn it on. Don't worry about product RSS. Don't worry about Google Merchant Center. We're not working with that. If you've got Google Analytics, you can plug your Google Analytics into your shopping cart so that it gives you all of this data. If you don't know about Google Analytics, this is a free service that Google provides where it keeps track of so much information of your customers, such as how long did they spend on my website, how did they get to my website, did they follow Twitter, did they search, what were the keywords that they used to find my product. That's all Google Analytics. And actually, I teach a pro uh, class on Google Analytics. I think it's in January. Uh, I'll mention it later. But if you've got Google Analytics set up, you turn this on and you plug in your tracking ID, and then in your Google Analytics control panel, it'll tell you this product sold really well, this keyword worked really well to find that product. It's kind of advanced, we're not going to get into it really, but if you know about Google Analytics, you can use this section. I'm not going to do anything here, but I will save at the bottom because I made some changes. Let's look at import. You might already have a website where you had e-commerce and maybe you're not happy with it. So you want to get your products into WP Commerce, into WordPress. There's an import button to help you do that. But the, the problem is that every e-commerce solution thinks they can do it the best way. And the way this works is basically you're importing a, a spreadsheet, an Excel file, basically, that has a list of all of your products and prices and so forth. From that other e-commerce solution, there's usually a way to export, and it gives you this special file with all your products. And then you come here and you do import. Now again, this is a lot easier said than done. Because WP Commerce, their database expects that every product is set up this way under supported fields. Every product has a product name, a description, an additional description, a price, a stock keeping unit, we'll talk about that later, a weight, what are the units of the weight, a stock quantity, a stock quantity limit. So perhaps one shopping cart solution that you have doesn't have the additional description. So you have to edit your spreadsheet to create a column which can be empty because then when I do the import, if you didn't have that additional description column, your price would be ending up in additional description. 
and then the price of that product would be the SKU, which might be $1,099 instead of $2. So this is a bit complicated to go from one shopping cart to another. I had to do it in my company a few times. It's complicated. We've spent days creating the database to go from one solution to the other. We went from, I don't remember the originator, but we went from one thing into a business catalyst database. Business catalyst is another really good shopping cart, but it also needed specific fields and specific order. And we had to spend time copying and pasting rows and columns, creating columns, checking everything, and they had like 5,000 products. So it took a while. Um, I've done it where I'm putting in a database from another shopping cart into a WooCommerce, uh, into a WP Commerce. And same sort of thing, effort. It's not hard, really. It takes effort, eye for detail, and being careful about what you're putting into your database. In the example here, banana, the yellow fruit, contains potassium, 67 cents. Banana, 150 grams. Um, zero means no limit to the products, and then empty column. Or apple red, comma, red brown juicy. And then it's a, and then there's a link. Red delicious, 25 cents. Red delicious skew, five ounces, 10 in stock. There is a limit, there are 10 in stock. So this is your template for your database. Uh, for your spreadsheet to import another database into this database. And this is always the case with everyone, unfortunately. You're going to go with WooCommerce, you're going to have to have a way to import as well. They've got their own requirements and quirks. You start with WP Commerce and go over to WooCommerce, you can, but you have to just be aware of what you're doing here. There is a template I'm sorry, not a template. Uh, the, the template is this, this design here. And then there is a way for you to upload it. So for us, at least we're starting from scratch. And maybe it might behoove you to start from scratch, even if you've already got some sort of shopping cart with some other kind of site, especially if they don't give you a way to export. Because all of these companies think they've cracked the code and can do it the best. And you might have a shopping cart that doesn't let you export, so you have to start over. For the moment, we're going to wrap up because the presentation screen has a lot of other sub-options that I want to talk about. And then I want to talk about taxes and shipping. And then we'll talk about adding products and prices and galleries and coupons and variations and all of that. And based on our syllabus, we have the time to do that. We'll, we're, we're just pacing ourselves. We want to look at these settings, get it all working, and then we can proceed. And so we did all of this stuff here. We've even gone a little bit into number two, but we'll talk about that soon next time. We're going to take a moment to make a duplicator backup of our site, and we'll wrap up the day. But any general questions about everything we've talked about so far? We'll keep doing it and it'll keep making more sense, but let's uh, make a duplicator backup again and then we'll wrap it up. Let's go on the left on your duplicator tab, click packages. Let's go to duplicator packages. On the top right, select Create New. You're creating a new backup of the site. It should have today's date, 2015-11-30, Victor's Bakery, whatever you called it is fine. I'm going to add a note. There's a button here on the right for notes. Click Notes, so we're going to add a note. What did we, what did we accomplish today in our project? I'm going to say added 
uh, WP eCommerce plugin began editing store settings. I'm going to say to do. What I still need to do is presentation, taxes, shipping. Then click on the bottom right, next. It's going to scan the site. Nothing should, should give us warnings or errors. As a reminder, if your site is more than 150 megabytes, sometimes the duplicator plugin struggles to compress so much content. The duplicator pro plugin handles that better. I've tried it. It works. And if you follow the link that I've got in the instruction number four, version two, if you follow the link that I've got at the bottom, you can get a discount, $32, for the Duplicator Pro, instead of, or $39, instead of the regular price of $59. And you can then use this on up to three sites. Question? What is my next response? Wait for it a bit more, and I'll be there in just a moment to, to double check it. I'm going to then at the bottom click Build. This is going to process. The site is a little bit larger now that we've added the duplicator plugin. It's got extra, extra features, extra screens and content. And then as we get to the part about adding product pictures and all of that, it'll get even larger. But this was compressed down to about 21 megabytes in my case took about 11 seconds and so now I'm gonna click installer and save it onto my USB and I'm also gonna click archive to save it to my USB which we've done before this should not be new and we're gonna wrap up at this point we'll do a little lab time until 4 make sure you get a copy of your files onto your flash drive when we come back next time we'll resurrect the site keep working on our settings add products and so forth Remember to have enrolled in the class. It's a brand new class. Don't just take the sticker and keep it as a souvenir. You want to make sure you've enrolled in the class on the website. And also make sure you sign in. You can sign out if you'd like, or I'll sign you out. That's it for the moment. We'll do some lab time. See you next time.